entrepreneurs, angel investing, and venture capital. This is a rapidly expanding and evolving part of our financial markets. For many entrepreneurs, this can seem like a complex and daunting landscape. For investors, navigating a wide array of opportunities can tax even the best resourced operations. In this mini-series, Kevin Montserrat of Consilience Ventures asks what's next for the venture capital industry. He follows the startup journey, first from the perspective of the entrepreneur, then the angel investor looking for early investment opportunities, and onto the VC funds looking to deploy larger levels of capital. Indeed, many features of the broader capital markets, such as data, analytics, and speed, will become increasingly important in this space. Kevin asks how each group is dealing with issues such as liquidity, sizing within portfolios, equity dilution, and the increasing volume of data. Each guest outlines their own experience of how they got into the business, how they've seen it develop, and what the future holds. Along the way, they provide a wealth of insights for everyone from experienced practitioners to those who are new to the industry. In this episode, Francesco Carrera, an academic who was headhunted by a leading European VC fund to develop an AI-based investment framework, looks at the development of data and technology in the process of analyzing opportunities, as well as some of its limitations within the seed capital market. So uh, why don't you start to tell us a bit more about who you are and uh, what you do? That'd be great. So, uh, yeah, my name is Francesco. Um, I'm currently the uh, research lead at Bolleton, which is one of the uh, major VC funds in Europe. Historically, it's been like a, a, an early stage investor, so like mostly doing Series A and um, a bit of seed investment as well. From June, actually, we started also like doing a bit more or less stage uh, investments into startups. So we are now covering uh, almost everything from seed stage to series C, D, whatever, like anything which is like pre-IPO basically. Um, and I joined the fund back in uh, 2019, so a couple of years ago, um, coming with a pretty strange background to some extent. I mean, like nothing, nothing too, too weird, but um, coming from academia, so I've actually done my PhD back in the days on machine learning applied to finance um, with, a, with a thesis on sentiment analysis for financial markets. So how you use like Twitter to, you know, uh, build training strategies, which of course didn't work. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here talking. I would probably be somewhere else, right? Uh, <laughs> but that, that said, um, uh, I, I bumped into a heavy C fund in my in my early days uh, called Antemis. Um, been been there for a while. Loved uh, the, the fund, fund, loved the ecosystem. Yeah, great, great fund. Um, and eventually, I stay like in this ecosystem for the last like four or five years, doing like different things uh, in different roles and different geos. And eventually, landed at Balderton like two years ago. Well, thank you very much. Uh, what a fantastic uh, journey uh, uh, so far. How, how, what's interesting is that Borderton, uh, you know, has hired you as, as an academic almost, you say. So what do you, think, what do you think is going on in the head of the VCs right now when they're thinking of bringing academics who has, um, you know, a few years ago, we, we would call VCs mostly traditional, um, very, very traditional, um, uh, you know, job effectively but right now if we're bringing the research if we're bringing the data science what, what do you think it's going on right now that is uh, that people can't see it's a good question i think like generally speaking uh and this is like a general trend like in the in the in the vc industry right um this this has been an industry which in the last 40 years or so it didn't really change that much so right now that I mean, we keep like investing in super, you know, cool and groundbreaking companies, whatever. But the uh, the structure per se of the of the venture ecosystem didn't really change that much. In the last, you know, three four years, um, especially like the major funds, they started like looking at new ways to basically to do things, um, which means you know like running faster processes, uh, better processes using data like to scale companies or to better analyze companies. So to some extent to make their own life, but also the entrepreneur's life is easy as possible, right? So I think that like, especially for us, when they, when they brought me on board, it was, um, it was because they had this insight, we should do something more with data, we should do something more to, you know, like to improve our, our internal workflows, but also the life of people that we are talking to, right? 
So eventually, when I when I joined, we started like, doing like a, a, a few a few different things, which is why like, my uh, my my title of research lead uh, my you know suggest everything and anything to uh, to some extent. But it has a component of research, as you might imagine, but also a, a big component of data and tech stack. So using specific tools or building specific tools for the investment team, as well as using data for sourcing mainly. So you finding new companies that we didn't know anything about, uh, but also like prioritizing screening and analyzing companies that we already uh, you know heard of or um, that we were like already been in touch with. Do you think do you think there is an avenue for VCs to use data to raise their own funds and to find to source LPs, or do you think the the data strategy is more focused uh, on uh, deal flow? What's your what's your view on this? It's a it's a fair question, and I think that if you are especially like an emerging manager, you you gotta think about like the overall stack. So from you know your your own investors to your portfolio companies and anything in between, right? The the reality is that nowadays this is not done that frequently, to be honest. So it's pretty much sourcing, and the reason why sourcing is actually pretty obvious, right? Sourcing is the low hanging fruit that it's is really like a shiny object. So if you can source <laughs> like a new company and invest in a new company. Uh, it's it's something that has like a life which is you know much much uh, quicker to some extent. So you can potentially find a company today and like close an investment like in a week, right? Yep. Uh, for LPs, is slightly uh, harder and longer when it comes to you know timeframes. And at the same time, you gotta always think having that for anything that you know boils down to using data, you gotta have data first. And the um, LP you know landscape mm-hmm. is not that. You know, structure in terms of data. Um, mm-hmm. There is there, there is not like a um, a unique database that you can go to and you know like check for yeah. investment thesis or family offices or pension fund or like yeah. different allocations or different you know geofogs whatever. So it's still like a lot network driven. That yeah. means that uh, you know trying to make it more automatic is not you know that trivial to some extent. Yeah, no, I really love the way you're looking at this. I think uh, there are some uh, investors, or I call them allocators in this case, LPs. Um, they, they are some are more public than some others, um, and uh, and of course the uh, reputation of um, the fund that you uh, work with right now doesn't have that problem of building the network because it has a track record, and it has been uh, doing really well. Uh, and at the same time, uh, I can see, I think you agree that some uh, emerging hedge fund managers may look at basically developing their own tech stack to uh, source LPs, but at the same time, it's not the same outcome than actually closing a deal because it's about nurturing conversation, it's about nurturing relationships, it's about ensuring that people uh, have the same values and they share the values of what you are building as a company effectively. So yeah, I really love, really love this, um, this analogy you just made. And, and it's um, yeah. it's funny, Kevin, if I if I if I may, because there is um, an interesting conundrum and as more as more paradox there, because like the bigger funds are the one that potentially need the less this kind of well need the Completely least. Completely agree. This, I was going to come yeah, down this to kind this. of tools, right? And eventually exactly. are the ones that invest in these things. While like emerging managers who are like the ones that should probably use more this kind of you know instruments and toolbox are the ones that can't really afford like to do that right because like data cost money um you know talent cost money exactly uh, if, even if like, you buy tools um off the shelf like it costs like a lot of money believe me um so eventually it, there is this gap between people that really need that and people that can afford that and it's not always clear who is doing what right absolutely i pretty pretty agree with that um in, in terms of you seeing the uh, landscape moving, the uh, the venture capital um, market moving, we've seen um, you know 10, 15 years ago we've seen the first incubators and since then and accelerators and since then they've grown like mushrooms. Now it sounds it seems like it's all about uh, venture studios. Are venture studios for you the you know better versions than incubators, or do you think they are complementary, or, or do you do you see um, do you see the early stage market, the kind of pre-seed, seed, pre-series A 
part of this exciting market moving? Do you see the mount, the boundaries moving, or do you think they are pretty still the same? Where effectively, you know, the startup will have still to go through incubator, accelerator, like traditional models, or try to raise money uh, via funds directly. Uh, wh- what's your view on how the market dynamic? Uh, it's a it's a fascinating question, and the reality is that I'm not sure to highlight the full you know overview. But what I, what I'm looking at these days is that there are different alternatives to some extent to like traditional VC and consilience is for example one example, right? But there are like you know revenue based financing model and exactly. other like you know alternative. I don't want to call them VC because they are like alternative investors. They are like, not VCs, exactly. Yeah, they do like things differently. So. Um, Yes, the the edges are a bit blurring and a bit like you know uh, not not that you know structures uh, structured as they were before, which mm. is like a good thing overall. And um, um, you were you were saying saying that correctly. There are accelerators, incubators, uh, solo capitalists, exactly um, crowdfunding you know, and- platforms, rolling funds in the US. There are so many. This is becoming a, a very hot, very competitive market. Um, and which puts more power in the end of the entrepreneurs. Would you agree? Uh, I I think it does. I think it does. Although probably like in the longer term, like generally speaking, when you have this market dynamics where um, you have, you know, more money, more investors and potentially, you know, like an higher quality or like an increasing quality in time, it means that eventually they're going to be like, it's 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 very easy to imagine um, you know a scenario where there is like a sort of barbell effect. So there are like a bunch of entrepreneurs that are like super super great, getting the most of of, of capital resources and allocation. And another part of this curve, which is you know people that didn't didn't really make it and eventually don't get funded. But the uh, and that's probably like something that not you know everyone thinks about. But uh, Kevin, like the reality is that like getting VC fund is not well, better not getting VC fund is not like the end of the world. Like there are like a bunch of businesses that might work without VC, and there are a bunch of businesses that don't really need VC at all. Because I mean, like this is uh, those kind of businesses that are called usually like yeah. lifestyle businesses, or uh, exactly. maybe they have like different different market potentials. Uh, so VC, like the reality is that it's not for everyone. It's for a specific subset of companies. Um, and the way in which the market is evolving, you're right. I mean, like, there are people and you know actors covering every single aspect, um, and that's because like, the market is expanding. That's like the bottom line. Yeah, the bottom line is that the market, the VC market, is growing. There are more entrepreneurs every year starting businesses. Um, really, like the point that you're making is that it's almost like. There are new uh, launch pads, right? There are new incubators, venture studios, and so on. And perhaps um, we are we get we getting those companies addicted to drugs because we give them a bit of money and we ask them to go very fast. And then there is a sudden where there is all of a sudden there is a cash wall, and then investors are not interested in those kind of businesses. Uh, although they could have been decent businesses if they wouldn't be um, uh, capital intensive businesses and kind of have been uh, taking a, a more linear approach to their development. And um, that is interesting. I, I see com- almost like a very small belt curve at the very very beginning of the companies where some of the companies are not in, uh, not relevant for VCs and still because they have been uh, e- educated uh, uh, about um, uh, the, the need of raising money mostly then uh, they, they turn to VCs but they are not investor ready but that's not even the question they are they are not even interesting businesses for VCs and and most in- investors uh, know that most investors most entrepreneurs don't really know that they especially when they come out of school um, so we are kind of basically almost like selling the wrong the wrong um, the wrong story to um, to entrepreneurs is that it's better to come to VC once you have um, you know the money, the product, and everything, um, and then try uh, try to be as independent as possible from the capital. Do you agree, or do you think uh, it's more nuanced? It's the game. Yeah, it's it's the game. It's um, so which is which is why like it's super super relevant to understand uh, from entrepreneurs what uh, what the 
uh, you know, like fund structure looks like, because if you don't really understand how a fund operate, how a fund, you know, funds raise like in the first place, you mm -hmm. can't really get like the essence of VC, right? And eventually the, um, the interesting thing there is that I think, generally speaking, that in any model, right, when you try like in any like micro or macro model that you want to look at, mm -hmm. you always get to a point where you have like a sort of like equilibrium, right? Um, we are right now in a phase where we are transitioning from one point to another. We haven't got there yet, but we are like still in this phase of, you know, changes and transition. That means that, for example, for entrepreneurs, there are like a bunch of resources out there for, you know, how, how like to fundraise tricks and tips and Huge metrics amount. and yes. yeah, everything, right? Which wasn't available like five years ago, to be honest. Mm. I mean, if you yeah. think about it five years ago, Sifted, that is like today one of the, you know, like most and well-known, like recognized publication in Europe, it wasn't even there. Um, and then yeah. that was like the same like for TechCrunch and like, you know, other, other major publication and resources, right? That means that um, right now there are more resources available but still that gap that, you know, helps people understanding what they really need and what should they, you know, go for or like, you know, achieve in order to raise funding or you know, like anything. Um, it's not that, you know, integrated yet. That means that potentially we are accumulating resources, uh, people that they simply highlight like to understand how to use those resources to fill the gap. Uh, and eventually like when, we, when, we, when we're gonna reach this new point, um, the market will be like in equilibrium and only people that knows, you know, like this game and they really know that they need this game to succeed will raise eventually, right? So you won't find like people that are, you know, asking money simply for the sake of asking, which is not what people should do. Like, uh, So in other, in other words, the, the VCs are going to see a higher quality deal flow because most entrepreneurs who are not... Um, uh, basically, uh, the kind of businesses uh, uh, that VCs are looking for won't even bother uh, invest uh, kind of applying. Yeah, yeah, possibly, possibly, right. But also, which is the next step to this to this you know line of reasoning. Uh, you you were mentioning before like business schools, right? So like yeah. in business school these days, uh, except for a few business schools, but like right now it's getting like a bit more uh, common. But it wasn't common like three years ago to have you know, specific modules on venture capital or specific yeah. modules or entrepreneurship or like how like to create a company, how to create a deck, how to you know start a business, blah blah blah, right? Uh, which is something that is getting right now a bit of traction. And my my point is we are building the traction right now. So there are still like a a few bunch of people that haven't, you know, caught up with this new trend. And eventually, the more they learn, the more will understand if they need it, what they need it, and what they had to ask for. So right now there is still these things that we are accumulating, you know, resources and, you know, material and guides and call it whatever you feel like, yeah. um, but not the many people that have still like, you know, um, studied that, that material uh, to the very like, you know, uh, details to understand if this yeah. is if for them or what this is consist of or you know like how like to fundraise and so on and so forth well that's brilliant analysis i think um what uh, i'm curious to hear what you think of what the kind of what the what the next decade uh for the vc which is you know a life a lifetime which is basically the life of a, of a vc right of a vc fund um where do you think you know if any emerging fund manager right now is trying to raise money you know, you know if, if you could share anything with with those with those emerging fund managers uh, VC fund managers um, what would you what would you share with them right now what would you what would you ask them to keep in mind as they see as, as, as basically you see the next decade um, of the VC market and how it's shaping up well, let's let's try like, to break it down for uh, from from the very first thing that you actually said. So, for example, you said that like, that that the VC life cycle is ten years, mm. which is still correct legally speaking. Yeah. But at the same time, it's also very very true that everything is shrinking down to the very extremes. So, like right now, like <laughs> if if five years ago you could afford like to have a five years investment period, right now it's kind of impossible. So you you gotta like invest everything like in three years. Yes. Uh, max, right? 
which exactly. is something that you are you are seeing like everywhere. I mean, like Tiger invests everything like in one year, which is like even even shorter. Yeah. Um, so um, generally speaking, the market is becoming more competitive. So that's something that you should you know consider when you start like a new fund. Um, which is which is good to some extent, um, and it makes like your work harder. Of course, as a as a, as a technologist, um, I would probably suggest people, hey, like try like to you know streamline your workflow as much as possible, because there are like a bunch of things that we do like on a daily basis that you know are like a completely waste of time, and even like small tricks actually save you like a, a, yeah. an incredible amount of minutes per weeks, which is like time that you can give to your portfolio companies, to the people that exactly. you talk to. Um, so tech and data are to some extent something that you know, like emerging managers should look at when they uh, when when they, when they try like, to raise like a new fund. And I'm not saying you know you should use AI or machine learning or no. fancy thing to you know spot the next unicorn. I'm just saying that I mean I like, use. Zapier or Tray yeah, or yeah. You know, anything else to simply to streamline a few steps, which really like saves you like a bunch of time. Um, and generally speaking, in terms of uh, market dynamics, I think that where many VCs are going, or at least like many, you know, uh, wise and good VCs are going, they are they are becoming um, not everyone like at the same pace, but more, more democratic in the way they allocate funding. They are becoming okay. more diverse. They are becoming more ESG aware. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's something that, I mean, like is, is, is getting like traction these days and it's probably gonna get more traction like in the next five to 10 years. Yeah, yeah. so maybe maybe we can uh, actually end up in that note if that's okay. So, you know, Facebook, um, Uber, Airbnb, Amazon, they use technology to reinvent the core of their industries, right? I'm not going to redo the kind of Uber largest tax, you know, largest uh, cab uh, company doesn't own any car and so on. You know exactly what I mean. Do do you see? Do you think that the next big VCs will become tech companies, or do you think they will? Um, the model of the VC will. Um, um, improved um, only by virtue of uh, kind of uh, more automation uh, of the actual uh, deal closing process. Uh, it's a tough question, Kevin. I mean, I really wish that you, that you didn't ask me that, but um, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure whether VCs are becoming tech companies or whether like tech companies are becoming, you know. Um, money allocators or even like something in between which might possibly be what is going to happen like in the next 10 years or so the thing i know is that you were you were mentioning a few a few key companies right so when it comes to any market regardless of what you're doing whether you are selling drinks uh, on a you know on a beach or you know like selling software and b2b cloud services yeah. anything right yeah. um there are only like three ways to win a market. So either either you win the market, or actually you fight in a market, you expand that market, or you create a new market. Yep. That's like the the only like three possible options. That's right. So competing in a market is something that takes time, resources, and you know fighting spirits, and you know <laughs> it's it's a it's a pretty tough job and this is where usually you get like the kind of you know doubts from investors like anyone else if google does that if facebook does that or are you competing directly with <laughs> with airbnb or you know like with whatever um expanding the market is was um it, it is what many of these companies have done in the past and the more the market you know grows the better it is like for everyone generally speaking which is what is happening today um possibly right um creating a new market is where uh, you really do like you know super big money for everyone um the the reality is that i think that we are still in the in the second scenario so we are not competing against bank for money no. we are literally like growing this ecosystem which is fantastic um, what what would probably change the dynamics and the and the pillar of the ecosystem if 
uh, it's, it's probably if we start creating new markets. But the reality is that like at this point in time, it's it's pretty hard like, to imagine new structures that you know gives the gives birth to completely different ecosystems, right? Um, I'm not sure whether that's like answer your question or gives you like more doubts. Than, I love it. No, but yeah. I mean, there's no there's no um, real answer to that. Nobody's got a crystal ball. I think your view it's super valuable. It's been very good. I really uh, wish uh, you and the fun really well, and uh, we'll talk soon. Yeah, thank you very much for having me, Kevin. We'll speak <laughs> soon.